My name is Naomi. Naomi Lucas. I run a a multi-service company called Ecla, and we focus on three things: projects, transmedia, and talent. And we're specifically passionate about Nigeria's creative industries. Graduate Pro is a brand under Ecla and it falls under the talent division of the company. Um, and I founded Graduate Pro. Graduate Pro was born out of frustration. I did quite a bit of travel around Nigeria on a previous job I was working on. And I, find, I, I found out firsthand how totally devastating the problem is in terms of skills and young people. So I decided I was going to do something about it, but I didn't get around to doing that until maybe two, three years after my trips around the country. So I set up Graduate Pro basically to bridge the gap between school and work for Africa's graduates. Um, and for me, I kept thinking about how to get the message to young people where they are, because I realized that um, the, the young people in Lagos and the Southwest basically were advantaged compared to others like in the North and other parts of the country who didn't have access to develop opportunities for self-development. So for me, from day one, I knew that whatever I was going to work on had to, had to eliminate the geographical um, challenges that we had in trying to reach young people. And that was how the whole idea behind the audiobook came. First, we started as a blog. Then we moved on to have an email where young people could send us messages. Um, if they had any concerns that had to do with their work and their career, they could send that to that email. Um, but it became overwhelming at a point for me. And I, I had a full-time job I was handling at the time. And dealing with that email was just too much at the time. So I thought, what do we need to do to fix this problem once and for all? And at some point, I started working on scripts for animation because I wanted to use TV as a medium. But I had issues with, with, with good animators, so I, I wouldn't say I abandoned the project. I left it for a bit until I could find somebody who could interpret the vision. But because I was thinking about how to reach young people, I realized that young people have a very, very strong music culture. There's a very strong music culture in Africa. I decided to plug into the audiobook format. And that's basically how we got we got round to, I'm a graduate now what? Now, Africa's biggest book project is basically the anchor for the strategy. We're saying that in all of Africa and perhaps globally, there is no project that has brought together 55 exemplary individuals to come together to talk about a particular thing targeted at young people and what they need to do. And by the time we're done covering Sub-Saharan Africa, we would have over 2,000 exemplary Africans talking about, not, not talking about, reading chapters of the book. For somebody like an Aldo Mikori, I think that he probably was the easiest to get and I knew that it was going to be easy to get him because he worked on, on Shopee, Graduate Internship Scheme. I don't know if you know that. He worked on that and he was very, very passionate about young people. So I knew for somebody like Aldo to be like, oh, fantastic, this is what we've been talking about. But to answer your question, which is basically, how did you get all of these people? Um, I won't tell you that it was easy. It took three to four months of sending mails, following up, phone calls, text messages, Twitter, Facebook, phone calls, text messages, Twitter, Facebook, to get people, not to buy in. Most of them bought in, um, but you need to get a commitment from these guys to say, yes, I am going to do this, especially because they're doing it for free. So anybody who is coming to work on the, on the audiobook needs to know that, okay, we're not paying you. This is like your give back to society. You're using, you're lending your voice to a cause, and then we want to sell the book and fund the boot camps that we've been planning to do like since forever. And that's essentially where all of this is going, but maybe you would ask some questions about that later. Yeah, but essentially, it, it took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of hard work. What I'm doing is theatre, arts and communication. That's essentially what it is. The audiobook is just a tool to pass a message across. And that's what I was trained to do. Pass messages across in a compelling, convincing manner 
to effect change in a party. You, you can actually, you, theater is a very powerful tool. And I think I learned that early on, that theater is a powerful tool to correct, to keep society in check, to make sure that people understand that, okay, there's seed time and then there's harvest time. And you can use it to change behavior as well. So for me, it was just using what I knew because I mean, for the audio book, you have, there's a script writing process. There's a documentary process. There's the audio book production process. All of these things are basically what I learned in school. So I didn't have any issues fusing, fusing them. Here's the thing. You finish school, you come out, you think the world owes you something. Actually, the world doesn't. It's a very competitive market. Um, the African job market is a very, very competitive one. So at every point in time, you're going to have to be asking yourself, am I good enough to be sold in that market? If you can't answer that question, and most young people who finish school are not really sure. In fact, they're not sure what the traders, what the people who come to the market to buy stuff want. They're just there in the market, hoping somebody finds them attractive. What this book does is it helps you understand the language of the market. And it helps you prepare yourself to be attractive to the people who are coming to buy. Now, there are quite a number of initiatives that have tried to do this as well. So I will not take glory for something I did not start. But I tell people that this is not a how-to book. Um, a lot of times people write to tell people how to do things. I was very particular in writing the content for the book that I don't tell anybody. So go for your master's after you finish school. That's the best thing to do. No. It's a why to book. If people understand why they need to do things, the how, they will figure it out themselves. But if you tell people how to do things, um, if things go wrong along the, along the line, they will blame you for the advice that you give them. So for me, for the young person, in one sentence, I will say that the book eliminates the confusion that young people feel when they finish school. And school is vocational schools, Tertiary, any tertiary institution, polytechnics, technical colleges, um, universities, you just name it, all of it. Okay. Um, there are quite a number of ways we intend to distribute, you know. We want to make sure that the book is in your face. The book is in you, like, you can't, you can't say, I don't know where to buy it. No, we want to make sure that doesn't happen. One. We're going to do audio CDs um, and we're going to do CDs. As advanced as technology is, in terms of the pervasiveness of technology in Nigeria now, I do understand that um, depending on what part of the country you are, that would, de that would determine how technology is used. Without sounding condescending, in the North, they may not be as, as savvy in terms of some of the things that we have access to here. So I believe that the CDs are a very important means to be able to reach these young people. We also plan to work with value-added service providers to make the content available as MP3 downloads. You pay some money and then you download. In fact, I would like to sell chapters if you ask me. So if you want chapter one, it's fine, buy chapter one. If you want the entire book, buy the entire book. And then of course, we're also finalizing talks with an audiobook publisher here in Africa to make the audiobook available via an app for people to be able to download. Yes. Um, now, piracy is an ongoing concern for me, especially because we don't have the institutional framework to deal with piracy. If somebody pirates my work, uh, there's no clear process for how to deal with that situation. And I know that it's a, it's a threat. It will remain a threat. Um, but essentially what we're doing is to make sure that from our end, whatever we can do to, to discourage that, we're going to do that. We're actually working to use, we're, we're hoping to use digital rights management software to make sure people cannot reap the content. Yeah, that's one of the ways that we intend to manage that situation. But you also have to understand that piracy exists in a void. And this is what I'm trying to say. When you want something, it's in high demand. And then you can't find it. The pirate comes in to meet that demand. So on our end, the instruction is, or it's instructive for us because one of the things we must ensure is that the book is available. If it's available, 
it's accessible and it's affordable. The Pirate doesn't have anything to offer. It's when 2 million people want it and you have only 200 copies. The Pirate will help you meet demand. That's how it works. That's a very beautiful question. Um, I must say that this is, this is a project that is funded by my company. And my company is a very small company. We've spent quite an amount of money. Um, so I'm having conversations with a couple of international agencies, a couple of clients here and there, to see how we can, we can find the funding that we need to drive this. But our intention, essentially, is to make sure that we've covered all the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa between now and the end of the year 2020. And that's a very, that's a tall order, but <laughs> we can do it. How do we intend to do this? Graduate Pro has country leads in a couple of countries where we have interest presently. Ghana, Gambia, and Ethiopia. We have country leads as we speak. And those country leads are waiting to replicate the process. But like I say, this is a first of its kind project. It has not been done anywhere before. So when you're doing projects like this, you want to make sure that you want to make sure that you learn what you need to learn before you before you go somewhere else to do it. So for us, it's important to start from beginning to end and then check what the learnings are. What could we have done better? What do we need to improve? Who do we need to bring on board? What do we need to stop doing? And then we have a blueprint that we can replicate in other African countries. Where we do not have um, country leads, we're actually working with um, a company called Victor and Victors. Um, run by Victor Parque Simensa and we would through him reach out to some key youth agencies within those different countries to make sure that we get and this is how we this is what makes the project interesting when we go to let me say Rwanda for example we go to Kigali we want to replicate this project we actually have a technical review committee that sits down to determine what within the book is relevant to the people of Rwanda what is not re relevant to the people of Rwanda will have to be taken out. And we have to put in content that reflects the local reality of the people in that place. And then after that, we, don't, we select another 55 Rwandans to read the book. So it's not you, Karin, Osi, Ukeji, and Aldo Mikori to go and um, read. No, you will pick Rwandans to read. When you move to Ghana, you pick Ghanaians to read. So essentially, it's Africans helping young Africans to find some clarity in this very murky African job market. That's what we're trying to do. Now, this audiobook will not be boring. I promise you. If it's boring, bring back your copy. I'll pay you times two of what you used to buy it. That would be like maybe 2K or 3K. I'll pay back to you. Anyway, this is what I'm trying to say. It will not be boring because I'm somebody who is very passionate about youth development. I'm very involved in the youth space. I wrote the book and decided to do audio because I know that young people do not like to read. And then even in doing the audio book, I know that audio books are boring. I use audio books to sleep. God forgive me. Like when I want to I play and then, you know, you just doze off. So this is what we've decided to do. We have our theme song for the audio book. Uh, which is basically what plays before the audio, the, the, a chapter starts and what plays after the chapter ends, all right? We have that. But here's the thing. For all 51 chapters of the book, we have 51 original songs. So, chapter one, um, let's say, talks about defining your purpose. Defining your purpose based on the mood and the message of that chapter has its own music designed to convey that message. You move to chapter two. It talks about planning your career or something similar. It has its own music. We actually have 51 of those. And that's a lot of work. I see the producer putting in a lot of work. But when I hear the kinds of stuff he's come up with, I told him, hmm, are you sure that these young people will not be dancing to this audio book? <laughs> because it just sounded like, oh my God, this thing is too sweet. So I'm hoping that that's actually just one, sound design. The second thing is, most of the chapters actually have skits before the book starts. So it's not chapter one, planning your career. What is career? Career is, no. There's actually a skit. A skit is basically like a short drama. Most of them are very funny, actually. Short drama 
I told you that it's in line with what I studied, so it was easy for me to do. Short drama that basically captures the essence of that chapter and then plays it out before the audiobook starts. Why are we doing all of this? We need to make sure that you are engaged. Either you are amused or we cause you to think or we cause you to just pause and say, wow. You know, so we, from chapter to chapter, basically, we want to make sure that you don't stop by chapter three and say, oh, waste of time. So it's very important to us and we understand that young people are restless. So we're doing everything we can with the content to make it engaging. Let me tell you, um, okay, the first thing that, that we did when I finished writing the book was that we got a cluster of young people that represented the target audience, undergraduates, um, job seekers, basically, people who were already working to read segments of the book. And we asked them a simple question. Would you buy the book? What struck you about the book? What do you think that we can take? What should we take out? What is not in the book? And then based on that, we reviewed the content and developed them into scripts. So in my mind, I'm writing this book that would speak to this young person and, you know, touch you and make sure that, uh, you know, here's what has happened. With the exception of one or two people, Every single narrator that has read a chapter have told me the chapter spoke to them. So they say, honestly, I read and I thought, is she talking about me? Like, <laughs> did somebody tell her my story and then she decided to write with it? So I'm getting, I've realized, I've got to that point where it's, it struck me that I'm trying to reach young people but the book might end up being for everybody. So I find that very intriguing, that you think you've written for this person, but somebody who has experience and you think doesn't need what this person needs, actually thinks that that content is also important for him. Yes. Hmm. I read everything, everything. There's no, there's no definition to, you know, some people like fiction, some people, like, oh, no. Just, if it's sweet, you know there's a difference between interesting and sweet. If it's sweet, I'll read it. Anything, newspaper, comic book, autobiographies, memoirs, uh, business books, fiction, horror, anything. I just, I love to read. Yeah. Maybe like, talk about heaven and life in heaven somebody should imagine it and build a story around that that would be nice even though it's false it would just you know paint a picture in my head i have all sorts of pictures about heaven like you know god is like really tall and you don't get to see him only his leg and all that kind of stuff so if somebody can help me just paint a picture mm -hmm. Yeah, fun stuff. Okay. I play the guitar. I read, like we've already talked about. Um, when I have the time, I go and see movies. Um, I would like to hang out with my friends some more, but I like to hang out with my friends. I sleep. Sleep is fun. If you work as hard as I do. Like, at the end of every day, I'm like, oh, God, thank you so much for sleep. It's actually fun. Mm. <laughs> We say that Africans don't like to read, but that's not true. That's not true. It is how we consume content that has changed. And the onus is on anybody who makes content to find out how people want to consume content. So they may say Zainab doesn't read because nobody can find a book on your table. But you've consumed like 60 web pages in a day from um, half post to, you know, just pages. That's 60 pages that you've read. But somebody says you don't read because their definition of reading is book, page one, page two. So I think we already read, but 
I see a lot of revolutionary stuff happening within the African reading space, where beyond just publishing books, um, maybe we'll begin to do a lot more movies from our content. Maybe we'll begin to find one or two animated content from like stuff we already have before. So essentially, the, the, the way content is presented, that's how I see reading improving, is going to change to suit the palette of today's generation. That's what I see. will be to make sure that the, the goals that we have set out for Africa's Biggest Book Project, that we, we meet, we exceed those expectations. Sub-Saharan Africa has 45 countries. 45 countries, we intend to include Egypt and Tunisia. That's 47 countries. If we say we want to do 47 countries between now and the end of 2020, essentially, there's no other work I can do because it's a lot of work. Um, so let's meet uh, my my the the next thing for me right now is to make sure that this doesn't die in Nigeria. It won't. I mean, because I've gotten <laughs> I've gotten inquiries from places as far flung as Kenya. When I'm not even ready, they are saying come. Yes, you know, from DC, from from New York. So before I go and overdream, let me just achieve <laughs> let me achieve this one first. This is very, very major and very important to me. But yes, let me quickly add that the audiobook is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. I want to do residential work readiness boot camps across Africa. Now, if you've ever thought of accommodating 30 people and feeding them for two weeks, you understand that I need money. So the, the, the audiobook is a funding strategy to make sure that we're able to do those boot camps. So beyond rolling out the projects, Africa's Biggest Book Project, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, Z Zimbabwe, and co. Zimbabwe? Okay, well, okay. Zimbabwe. <laughs> yeah, rolling them out in those countries. As soon as we get funding to implement a boot camp, it will happen somewhere. So there's boot camps on one hand, and then the project on the other. I've always been somebody that gives. I, I, I can remember my earliest memories of me is giving my breakfast to people who didn't have food. That's just how I'm wired. It's a, I don't know if it's a disease because sometimes even I will be hungry, but I can give you what I have. Um, and you asked a very important question. And, um, I asked myself an honest question when I started this. I said, I need young people to pay attention. How do I get, you know when you know your people, these kind of things will come to you. How do I get them to pay attention? And I asked myself an honest question. Is my voice powerful enough to read 55 chapters? The answer was no. You have to be, when you look in the mirror, you have to be honest about the things that you see. And I thought, okay, it was just a very, it was a, my imagination is very overactive. This is, all of this is a result of a very, is the result of a very overactive imagination. So I asked myself, what is it going to take to get, at that time we're thinking we're going to need 51 um, people. What is it going to take to get 51 exemplary Nigerians to read this book? <laughs> I remember one or two of the people that I spoke with <laughs> were like, God, I'm missing, like for God's sake. In fact, the, a couple of them, one told me, please go and get a job. Like, it's like you're going crazy. Someone else said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it won't work. Sorry to tell you like strongly like that, but it won't work, just forget about it. But I'm a stubborn person. So when you say don't put your hand in the fire, that's the minute I want to put my hand in. So I will see what, why, what's in the fire? So for me, it was even some, like some sort of like an experiment. I wasn't afraid to go out and fail. I was like, let me, let me try it. Nobody has done it before. So why, why would somebody tell me something nobody has tried will fail when, when you've not even tried it? And that was, that was how we came up with the list, sent the names out. And, you know, I was very excited by the response. Some of the responses I got were horrible. 
But those ones that came, that just said, oh my God, thank you so much. I'm honored. I just thought, oh, fantastic. So people are feeling the project. And that's how come we ended up with the list that we have. I feel that where this project is going, we haven't even started. Like even I can't see it. But I see what it's doing to the people who have experienced the recording sessions. I can see what is done for them, to them, and how excited they become. They just say, I can't wait for this to get out. This needs to get out. So if you see I've opened up doors for, for people, I'm, I'm happy. I'm ha That's what I wanted to do, collaboration. We don't know how to work together in this part of the world. So you have this small one-man business. Instead of you to partner with this guy that knows how to do video, you will do video, do audio, do camera, do sound, light, only you. And you can't, you can't grow because it's just you, you know? So for me, I'm very, I'm very open to collaboration. In fact, I've had a lot of youth development people and organizations saying, Naomi, how can we plug in? And just yesterday, I was speaking with my team at the office, like, how do we plug? We need to plug all of these guys in. It's not, there's no competition for me, ever. Just cooperation. How we can. This guy is very big. Everybody can shine. That's how I think. The only person you should be in competition with is yourself. Set your own records. Break your records. Set another. Break it. The moment you begin to look left, right, up, and down. That's the moment that frustration is going to seep into your bone marrow. Because guess what? No matter what you do, there are people for whom life will seem like a breeze. Like everything is just going well for this person. No matter what you do, there are people who no matter how hard they try, things will not just work. And you just wonder why is it going that way for that person? So find your space, work in it, leave everybody alone. When you do it that way, you realize that because you've been setting your own standards and breaking them, you become a standard. Hi, my name is Naomi Lucas, Creative Director, Africa's Biggest Book Project, and you're watching Pulse TV.